Love, episode 9. We left it in such a dark place. The tsunami had just hit the west coast of Thailand. Patong took a real pounding. Thousands lost their lives. Joe is on the other side of the world in the Caribbean. He's on that six week spell. It's going to be pretty much the last day in January before he can get back there. Must have been such a hard, hard time for him, those six weeks. Every spare moment he had, he was online, watching photos, images, trying to see if he could spot May or Nan or Far on any of the footage, no luck at all. He did lots of searching. The crazy thing, in the time they were together, he knew May as May, he didn't know if that was a Thai nickname or her real name. The same for Nan and Fa. He didn't know their surnames. He didn't have mobile numbers, email addresses. He only ever had the one receipt with the shop name and the shop phone number. That phone line has stayed dead totally every day he's tried it. He didn't know which villages any of them came from, family where it's only when you suddenly find yourself in some sort of position like that you realize that you've got no contact no details the patong a lot of damage the thai people resilient a big cleanup operation a lot of the hotels were damaged the tourists were not there they just kept away all the construction crews came in and they started clearing started rebuilding straight away but no real footage of that probably the longest six weeks five weeks of Joe's life finally the last day of his company working for that company comes he says his goodbyes he can't wait, he's onto the first plane straight over to Thailand. Now he's been trying to book hotels, nothing. They're all the ones that are open, are booked. They've just got people, builders, that are construction, locals that have lost their homes are in there. Nothing at all in Patong or Karen or Qatar. Couldn't find a thing, but he found a hotel near the airport. Well, that's about 30 minutes from Patton, but he had no choice, so he's booked a couple of nights. He lands straight out of the airport into an airport taxi to the hotel. Tells the taxi driver, wait, I want to go to Patton. It was 10, 11 in the morning. Now, he's only got about 10 days. That's all he's got, because he's got to go on to the Asian company and start work checks into the hotel, back into the taxi. Now that taxi ride must have been horrific because there's, as he came up over the top hill and you drop down into Patong, suddenly the landscape's changed. There's, the roads are all open. It's, this is six weeks afterwards, after the um, tsunami, the, the roads are open, but there's a lot of rubble there's a lot of skips and there's just lots of building work going on. You couldn't tell what the damage, how bad it was from six weeks later because so much had been cleared. He just wanted to go straight to May's shop and taxi took him down Second Road, which hadn't really been hit too bad on the left of Second Road, but on the right, a lot of buildings, a lot of the concrete buildings were poorly constructed, very single pillars, single concrete, three inch block work, that would have just straight over. Ran all the way down second road to the end, turned the corner, and that is where his heart is in his mouth. As he turned the corner heading down to the beach, it's about a 500 meter section, and all the first half on his right, that was buildings before, that was gone totally 
all the rubble had been moved and they were concreting a big pad there. It was going to be some sort of new shopping zone area. Totally changed. On the left, the wall from the resort, where the sort of five foot wall, the wall was down to a foot and they were rebuilding it. That, that had took a pounding. And as he came down, he told the taxi driver to pull over and stop a couple of hundred metres from the bottom paid the taxi driver for the hotel and all the way down to Paton, about a thousand baht, just chucked it at him. And he's walking down the pavement towards where those three bars are in a row, heading towards the beach. As he gets to the three bars, the, the roofs had all been ripped off them, all the upright pillars, the bar sections themselves were pretty sturdy concrete and looking like the top of being pulled off them, but there were builders there. Again, he, he's heading down, and as he gets down to the bottom, he turns round by the last bar, it's where the shops are, a May shop, and there is nothing. He comes around the corner, so he turns right, and he's looking up the alleyway, where the toilet lady was at the end, all the shops on the left were the maze, the tailors, the salon, they were single story basic shops, just concrete and rubble. He could even see bits of a desk that were from May's shop there in the pile that hadn't been cleared six weeks on. Oh, absolutely devastated. He's looking around just on the off chance that May would appear. To the left is that chemist. All the fronts been pulled down and being rebuilt. He, little did he know that behind that, the shops behind the single story, they'd all gone. But there was the sort of a, a, a block of a condos, which were the single rooms where May and Nan lived. But it was single block work. It was cracks all the way up the building. That was going to be pulled down. It was too dangerous. And when the water went up that road, it would have gone into all the rooms. If anyone was in there, up to the first few floors, there would have been no chance. Devastation. His, he doesn't know what to think. It looks terrible. He doesn't know where they live, their room. The shop is just flattened. He starts to, trying to talk to the builders and ask people. The No one at the shops, there's no one there working on those at the moment. Where the toilets were at the end is gone. All the people working on the bars are just builders. They haven't got a clue. They don't understand him. They're all tight. He comes round onto the beach. And he's going to walk along the beach. You can see that so much building work going on. Up and down. Again, he doesn't recognise anyone. It's at this point. He seems maybe to have come to the assumption that Something's bad happened. Something bad has happened to them. On the beach, he bumps into a tourist police. A guy and a lady tourist police and a policeman. And he asks them, and they speak English. And the gentleman tourist police, reasonably English, Joe explains to him the situation, he's looking for someone, he's just landed. And the tourist police guy, okay, at the other end of the beach, by Bangla Road, there's a centre that's been opened up, it's been open since the beginning, since it all started. If you go there, register, they've got names and things, they'll pass you on to the relevant people. Bit of hope for Joe straight along to the registration center it had been out for six weeks it pretty much was closing down but there was a lady she spoke english possibly from the tourist board he only knew may's first name as may he talked to the lady told her about her shop nan and fart the lady we don't know the names uh, we uh, we've got records of, of People that are missing and passed away, etc., etc. But 
name May, Nan and Far could be anyone. These are all Thai names. She says the only hope that I can give you, and it's not so much hope, is if you go to the morgue, they've got a book with all the photos of everyone that didn't make it. That's your only option, apart from walking around and trying to talk to people and find if anyone knows them. But Joe couldn't face that. He could not go to that morgue and look at pictures. He just, there's no way he would ever do it. He just couldn't face it at all. No way. He walked around for five days talking to people didn't recognize anyone didn't find anyone five days and evenings he got back to the hotel taxi back over walking around everywhere he could just in a circle second road beach road thing no tips no idea no clues he sort of on that first day he'd sort of given up subconsciously maybe that was it after six days he's only got a few days left he thought i'm gonna go up to bangkok for a couple of days i'm gonna go off to asia do the job i'll come back in three months or so fingers crossed he leaves phuket flies up to bangkok has a day in bangkok getting some shirts made at tailors he's got a day and a half left orders all those wandering around Sukhumvit road um, been to the tailors for a second fitting just after lunch soy 5 southern bit road coming back towards soy 4 comes across a bar on the street there blue lights it was the blue factory or blue bar or something but it had industrial aluminium kick plate flooring that attracted him and the blue lights so I'm going to get a drink and he went in there's a a few seats there by the one bar stairs going up with pool tables and another bar made his way upstairs round the corner to the bar ordered a drink got a drink didn't want to play pool and there was nice leather settees around the edge mostly taken but he noticed the toilet and two double settees there one had a foreigner in it near the toilet and so he went and sat on the other one put his beer down sat down sort of slumped he's got the next day he was heading off to work new job <sighs> what a horrible horrible time for him totally devastated he'd lost the love potential future wife the person that could have made him happy forever does he love asia now after this and he slumped and then suddenly his his name being called out, Joe. Looks to the right, it's the foreigner in the next seat. And he looks and he thinks, doesn't recognize him and then he suddenly twigs, he does recognize him. It's the manager from the bar in Patea, um, a year or so before that he'd gone in the bar a few times, three or four times. That's right, it was me. I was sat on the chair next to him. I recognized him. Called across, he twigged who I was. He jumped up and he came towards me. I stood up to put my hand out and he threw his arms around me and gave me a big hug. I wasn't that friendly with him. Then he released and, can I sit with you? And he grabbed his beer and came and sat down. He spent the next 30 minutes <coughs> excuse me, telling me about his Thailand life after we'd met in the bar. I remembered him because he was so fascinating with his job and I recognised him straight away. Those 30 minutes, I was devastated for him. He'd lost the, the woman um, that he'd fallen for. It was such a sad story. But at the end, <coughs> he mentioned that he was going to come back in a few months to look for her again. I thought he'd said that he'd lost her, but maybe he hadn't. And I sort of asked him to backtrack and so you haven't found her, you don't know. He 
explained. Me being a sort of puzzle person, I like to fix puzzles. If someone wants something cheaper, I'll try and help them find it cheaper. I was taken back by his story. We exchanged emails. He told me he was next day going off to work and that he'd come back in about two or three months. But he didn't hold much hope after this time period. Um, I asked him a few questions that had he not have any contact details or didn't they try and contact him? Did they have his details? Nothing. And I said to him, well, I have contacts still from when I was at the bar. A couple of the girls have contacts in Phuket. I'll ask about, if you don't mind, any photos. And he pulled out the only photo he had on the phone. I was sat working on my laptop. We managed to get a transfer of the photo to my phone and then onto the laptop. And I said, well, I'll ask about, but I can't promise anything. And he gave him a little bit of hope. And he had to go. We spent maybe another hour drinking and chatting. Off he went. Next day he collected all his clothes from the tailors and things and off he went. Don't know how long he was going to be on that new job. He didn't really know whether it would be four weeks, eight weeks, whatever. But he said he'd be in touch. We had each other's emails. But he hadn't found May, hadn't found Nat, hadn't found Nan or Far. Nobody, nobody knew. Didn't see anyone from them bars before. It was just... <sighs> doesn't bear thinking about. Anyway, I'll see you on next episode.